So finally, something we're going to be talking about throughout the rest of the course, but I'm going to give you some more treatise on now and then try and imbue everything else we do with this sort of thinking, is we're going to talk a little bit more about the p-value, and we're going to talk about it in even more detail. The reason I'm doing this is to demystify some common mistakes about the meaning of a p-value and also to, to make you think about, is this number really as powerful as some people give it credit for? What can you learn? And what can't you tell from just a p-value? So just to remind you and to start off definitionally, p-values are probabilities. They are numbers between zeros and ones. Probabilities are proportions, in words we've been using somewhat synonymously. And small p-values, what they mean, our interpretation of them, is that the sample results we saw are essentially unlikely if the null hypothesis in our hypothesis testing framework were true. And definitionally, what that means is the p-value is the probability of obtaining a result as or more extreme, as or more unlikely, than you did by random sampling chance under the null hypothesis, if the null hypothesis were true. In other words, more colloquially, it's how likely the sample result you got is, and other things even less likely, if the null is true. The p-value is not, this is a common mistake, the p-value is not the probability that the null hypothesis is true. The p-value is a statement about the likelihood of your sample results were the null hypothesis true. People put a lot of stock in p-values, but the p-value alone imparts no information about the scientific substantive content in the result of a study. Just consider for this, for example, suppose I told you the only thing I told you about that serial and cholesterol study we talked about was, hey, guys, the researchers found a statistically significant, at P of 0 0.005, they found a statistically significant difference in average LDL cholesterol levels in men who had been on a diet including cornflakes versus the same men on a diet including oat bran. If that's all I told you, and frequently this is the way things are phrased, but if that's all I told you, would you know which diet actually showed lower average LDL levels? Not from that statement. And how much was the difference in this average LDL cholesterol levels? Maybe statistically significant, but does it actually mean anything nutritionally? You wouldn't be able to pick that up either from just hearing the p-value. If the p-value is small, we tend to decide to reject the null in favor of the alternative. But one of two things could have actually occurred. We could have seen a rare event under the null, and it was so rare that we decided our results were inconsistent with the null, or the null was false. We don't know which of those is the case, but we're banking on the null being false. We're setting our threshold for unlikeliness at some low level and saying if our result comes in as less likely than this when the null is true, even if it could have happened, we're going to discount the null as a possibility for the truth. So we stand to make a mistake. Sometimes we'll reject when we've actually observed a rare event and then under the null. And that's called making a type 1 error. Rejecting the null in favor of the alternative when, in fact, the null is true. We'll never know we did this, but this is the uh, type of error we can make in the hypothesis testing paradigm. And the problem of making this type 1 error is, in fact, called the alpha level, something we already talked about, or the significance level. When you set your alpha level at 0.05, you're saying, I'm willing to call any sample result that comes in less than 5% likely when the null is true inconsistent with the null, even though it could have happened. So you're setting your threshold for rejecting when you shouldn't, when you declare the alpha level at a fixed value. How do we deal with the p-value in terms of deciding between the null and alternative hypothesis? Well, if the p-value is less than some predetermined cutoff, like that magical 0.05, and you didn't see me do this, but magical was in air quotes. The result is called statistically significant. This cutoff, again, is the alpha level. The alpha level is the rejection level. It's the probability of making a type 1 error we're willing to live with. It is essentially you're setting the probability of falsely rejecting the null when the null is true at some low level, such that things that come in under that probability you're going to rule as inconsistent under the null and reject the null. And the idea is to keep the chance of making a mistake when the null is true low and only reject if the sample result is unlikely. And again, this unlikeliness threshold is determined by the alpha level, which we said more often than not is set at 5%. 
So let's just categorize this as one of the types of mistakes we can make, and we'll be talking about the other types as well in the second part of the course. But here's the two-by-two two table where we're detailing the truth, what's really going on, the null or the alternative, versus the decision we can make with our hypothesis testing process. So if we decide to reject the null when, in fact, the null is true, we've made a type 1 error. We won't know we've done that, but that's actually what we've done. The other thing where we can go wrong is actually not rejecting the null when the alternative is true. We're going to spend more time talking about that in the second part of statistical reasoning. Remember I told you to always focus on the p-value in the middle of your state output, but I didn't tell you why? I was trying to create a little bit of mystery. Well, the, there are other p-values given. The one we're looking at is called a two-sided p-value. The other ones are called one-sided. So let me refresh your memory about that blood pressure oral contraceptive study with the 10 women where we took the before and after blood pressure measurements before and after a regimen of oral contraceptive use. The two-sided p-value for the null that the difference in the before and after blood pressures was zero at the population level, the p-value was 0 0.009. So the probability of getting a result as or more extreme than the sample mean difference we observed if the true mean difference were zero was 0 0.009 under that 0.05 threshold. But this considers, listen to the language here, the result as or more extreme than observed, either positive or negative. We saw a result that was positive, a positive change in blood pressure of nearly 5 millimeters of mercury on average. And what we considered was all changes that were 5 millimeters or more away from the null of zero, either above or below. We considered happens in either direction. A one-sided p-value would only consider probability of a more extreme positive result than observed or a more extreme negative. Only considers extremes in one direction of the null when evaluating how likely your sample result is and results less likely. If the direction of the alternative hypothesis in the one-sided test is the same as the direction of the sample result in terms of above or below the null, then the one-sided p-value will be half of the two-sided p-value. So here's an example here from that state output when we did the t-test for testing the null in the blood pressure oral contraceptive study. And the one-sided alternative that the true mean difference after or contraceptive minus before at the population level is greater than zero. If that's our alternative, it's a one-sided alternative, we're only considering possibilities in a positive direction, true means greater than zero. Our sample mean difference was also greater than zero, so look at the p-value associated with that. It's 0.046, half of that two-sided p-value, because we're only considering extremes in one direction. If instead we had postulated that the true mean was negative, less than zero, that blood pressure tended to decrease after oral contraceptive introduction, then our p-value would be the complement to the other one-sided p-value, and it would be very high, 0.9954. In some cases, a one-sided alternative may not make scientific sense. In the absence of pre-existing information in evaluating the blood pressure oral contraceptive relationship, would either result be interesting and useful, whether it goes up on average or goes down? In other cases, a one-sided alternative also often makes scientific sense. You're not generally in clinical trials. We're not really interested if a new treatment is worse than the old. We only care whether it's better. However, Despite the fact that one-sided alternatives sometimes make scientific sense because of what I'll call the culture of the p-value and the sanctity of the 0.05 cutoff, one-sided p-values are viewed with suspicion. The reason being that if you pick, as we showed before, the one-sided alternative that it favors your sample result, then automatically your one-sided p-value will be half of its two-sided counterpart. So let me just put this in your head. Suppose you do a study where the two-sided p-value comes in at 0.07, and it's not quite under that 0.05 cutoff. What could you do if all you were worried about was 
quote unquote being significant. Well, you could report the proper one sided p value, in which case it would be 0.035, and you'd now have significance. In this course, we're going to use two sided p values exclusively. I'm not against one sided alternatives again, but in the culture of p values and the reverence given to the almighty 0.05, one sided are viewed with suspicion, and generally they are used to skirt a situation that is close to 0.05 in the two sided scenario but doesn't come in below it. What is the connection? Hopefully by now you've started to corner that there's some connection between hypothesis testing and confidence intervals. We're making statements about the truth. We're just doing it in sort of two different approaches. The confidence interval gives plausible values for the underlying population parameter. In most what we've worked with so far, the underlying population parameter is a mean or a mean difference. What we say is data, we basically say we're going to use our data to take me to the truth and create an interval that hopefully includes the truth. But we start with the data and go to the truth. Hypothesis testing, we take the opposite approach. We start with two choices for the truth and then come to the data and say, help me choose one of those. In either case, we're making statements about some underlying quantity like a mean difference at the population level. We're just doing it in two different ways. But they, these ways are complementary. Think about this. If we have a 95% confidence interval for a mean difference and zero is not in the confidence interval, then we would actually reject the null that the mean difference at the population level is zero when our significance level is 0.05. Why is that? Well, first think about the logic. If we don't include zero in our confidence interval, we're ruling out zero as a possibility for the mean difference. And if hypothesis testing and confidence intervals are complementary, we should come to the same basic conclusion with either approach. So if we rule it out by the confidence interval, because zero is not a presence in that interval, we should also rule it out with hypothesis testing, which would mean we reject the null and get a p-value of less than 0.05. But what about the mathematical logic? Well, what do we do with a confidence interval for 95%? Let's just think big samples now, and you, you, this can be easily generalized to smaller samples where you have to use a t-distribution. The same logic applies. With confidence intervals, we start at our observed sample mean difference, and we go two standard errors in either direction. So if zero is not in the 95% confidence interval, then this must mean that our sample mean, x bar, is either greater than two standard errors away from zero, above or below. We've spread our rings around x bar, two standard errors either in direction, we haven't hit zero. Hence, x bar must be more than two standard errors away from zero. Hence, if we're doing a hypothesis testing situation, remember what we do is we start with zero as the truth and measure the distance of x bar from zero. But if the confidence interval doesn't include zero, we already know this distance will be greater in absolute value than two. And when we go to look up the corresponding p-value from a normal curve, it will come in at less than 0.05. Let me put this out there to you. What do you think the synchronicity, what level of confidence would be comparable to an alpha level of 0.01? Or how about an alpha level of 0.10? What confidence intervals have the same similar relationship with those alpha levels that we just saw with a 95% confidence interval in an alpha level of 0.05. The confidence interval can't give you the exact p-value, but you can ascertain where it relies to some complementary cutoff like we just showed. So in the blood pressure oral contraceptive example, the 95% confidence interval would tell us by virtue of the fact it excludes zero, that the p-value for testing the null of zero would be less than 0.05. But it doesn't tell us that it's 0 0.009. So you could go ahead and do the hypothesis test as well to get that exact p-value. But of course, if you're using the computer, you get it all at once anyway. The confidence interval and the p-value are complementary, but you can't get an exact p-value from just looking at the confidence interval. And more importantly, you, as we sort of demonstrated in the introduction to this part of the lecture, you can't get a sense of the scientific or substantive significance of your study results by looking solely at a p-value. Another important point, statistical significance alone does not imply or prove causation. We don't want to attribute more to this phenomenon of statistical significance than we can. So we already said this before, but just to reframe it in this idea, in the blood pressure oral contraceptives example, 
we criticized the study, saying there could be other factors that it could explain the change in blood pressure we observed, or the statistically significant change that we observed, other than the oral contraceptive use. The only thing we've ruled out with that low p-value is random sampling error as the explanation. If we really wanted to bolster and investigate whether it was oral contraceptives that were causing this, we need to do a better study where we'd have some sort of comparison group of similar women who were not on oral contraceptives. And that we'll get into this type of study in the next set of lectures. Maybe the most important thing to know is just because something's statistically significant doesn't mean it's important. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't, but statistical significance alone is not conclusive about the importance or scientific importance of something. So just here's a hypothetical example. Suppose we had done the same study, but we actually looked at 100,000 women who were going on a regimen of oral contraceptives, and we measured their blood pressure right before they started and three months after they had been taking oral contraceptives. Suppose in this case the sample mean change in blood pressure was 0.03 millimeters of mercury, but the sample standard deviation was 4.6. Well, if we actually did a hypothesis test here to test the null that the true mean change or difference was zero, the p-value is 0.04. So despite the fact that this observed change is so minimal, the fact that we have such a large sample size makes our standard error so small that it registers pretty far from the null in terms of standard errors. And this can happen when you're looking at big studies. Sometimes every association that is investigated will be significant simply because the standard errors for our Sample statistics are so small that the ratio of our estimate to the standard error looks like it's far away from zero, even though the magnitude of the effect is very small and not scientifically or substantively significant. So in this case, you know, it would be hard-pressed to convince somebody into pulmonary health that this was a problem. The mean shift was at the magnitude of 0.03 millimeters of mercury. You might say, well, it's statistically significant, but substantively it may not mean anything. So it's also important to report the estimate itself and a confidence interval to hone in on that uncertainty. Here, the confidence interval ranges from 0.002 millimeters of mercury to nearly 0.06. So that lays it out pretty clear that despite the fact that the result is statistically significant, there's not really anything going on of interest. Conversely, the lack of statistical significance is not necessarily the same as a lack of scientific significance either you must evaluate in the context of the study and sample size. Just like big N can produce small standard errors that make most things significant, small Ns sometimes produce non-significant results, even though the magnitude association at the population level is real and important. We just can't see it with the study we've got. And this is a phenomenon called low power. And power is related to that table of truth versus decisions I gave in the beginning here. We're going to focus a lot on power in the second part of this course. So I'll just push this off and create some excitement for you to come back. But low power in small sample studies makes not rejecting hard to interpret. Does it really mean the null is true or we just couldn't see a difference that was there? Sometimes small studies are designed without power in mind just to generate preliminary data. Suppose you wanted to do a large-scale study on the relationship between blood pressure or an oral contraceptives, but nothing had been done at all. Before you could get funding and they go ahead to do a large-scale study, you might have to demonstrate some empirical evidence of a possible relationship. So a study with 10 women, kind of the type we described, may be important to do that, even if the findings weren't statistically significant, which they happen to be in our situation. But even if they weren't, they might put some data on the table to help better design the larger study. And again, not to keep pushing things off to the second term, but we'll talk about how to incorporate pilot study data into the process of designing a larger study in the second part of the course as well. So don't worry. This isn't the end of talking about p-values. We'll be doing it from here on in. But I just want you to think about what you know and what you don't know when you're given a p-value.